Greetings students and welcome back to another lecture on quantum mechanics. In this video we're going to prove slash derive the generalized uncertainty principle. We'll start by supposing that we have two Hermitian operators a hat and b hat. We'll also suppose that the expectation values of the operators a hat and b hat with respect to some state vector psi are given by the following expressions. So these are our initial assumptions. But there's two questions that immediately arise from these initial statements. The first question is, what's our goal? Why are we trying to prove the generalized uncertainty principle in the first place? The second question is, why are we choosing A and B to be Hermitian operators? Why not some other types of operators? I'll start by answering the first question. The reason we're trying to prove the uncertainty principle is that we want to check what limitations quantum mechanics puts on the uncertainties of observable quantities like position, momentum, etc. And the best way to check the limitations on the uncertainties is to use Hermitian operators. Which leads me to my second question, why use Hermitian operators? Well, as we mentioned in the previous video, links in the description, Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues and expectation values. In fact, this is the basis of the second postulate of quantum mechanics, which we also discussed in that previous video. The second postulate states that every physical observable from classical mechanics has a corresponding Hermitian operator in quantum mechanics. And as a result, because Hermitian operators correspond to physical observables, we can find the uncertainty on those observables, our ultimate goal, by playing around with Hermitian operators. So that's why we're using Hermitian operators, not only because we're interested in the uncertainties of their corresponding physical observables, but also because their uncertainties have an easily recognizable significance since the expectation values of Hermitian operators are real. Anyway, let's get back to the proof of the generalized uncertainty principle. We'll begin by defining two new operators, which I'll call delta a hat and delta b hat. These two operators will just be the deviation of the operators a hat and b hat from their respective expectation values. Let's square these two delta operators and here's what we'll get. Now in the next step we're going to find the expectation values of these squared operators, starting with delta a hat squared. After plugging in our delta a hat squared we can then expand out the right hand side using the linearity of these operators. Since the expectation value of a hat comes out of these bracket terms, we can carry out some algebraic simplification to arrive at the following equation for the expectation value of delta a hat squared. Now you know from basic statistics that the expectation value of the square of a quantity minus the square of that quantity's expectation value is just the variance of that quantity, which means that the expectation value of delta a hat squared is sigma a squared. This I'm going to call equation 1. Now using the exact same procedure I could show that the expectation value of delta b hat squared is sigma b squared. This I'm going to call equation 2. In addition to taking the expectation values of delta a hat squared and delta b hat squared, we're also going to find the expectation value of delta a hat times delta b hat, so the cross term. We know that half the commutator of delta a hat and delta b hat is just half of delta a hat delta b hat minus delta b hat delta a hat, just by the definition of commutators. Now using the definitions of delta a hat and delta b hat, we can simplify this expression to just become half the commutator of a hat and b hat themselves. Now the anti-commutator of delta a hat and delta b hat is given by the following equation. So it's pretty obvious that if we add the halves of the commutator and anti-commutator of delta a hat and delta b hat, we'll get the product of delta a hat and delta b hat. But since the commutator of delta a hat and delta b hat is just the commutator of a hat and b hat, the product of delta a hat and delta b hat is just half the commutator of a hat and b hat plus half the anti-commutator of delta a hat and delta b hat. This result I'm going to call equation 3. Now let's define two states. The first one I'll call f, which is just delta a hat operated on the vector psi. And the second I'll call g, which is just delta b hat operated on the vector psi. Let's take these two states that I've defined and apply the Schwartz inequality to them. 
From a previous video where I talked about the properties of the Dirac notation, I also spoke about the Schwartz inequality, which I'm going to apply to f and g here. Once I do that, here's what I'll get. And I'll label this equation, or inequality really, as 4. What we're going to do now is express equation 4 in terms of delta a hat and delta b hat. You might remember from my previous video on examples of operators that to convert from a ket vector to a bra I have to take the Hermitian conjugate. So if I plug in the definition of the ket vector f, I'll be able to find the bra version of f in terms of delta a hat and psi using the properties of Hermitian conjugates. And in the end, we'll end up with the following expression. So therefore the inner product of f with itself is just the bra psi, delta a hat conjugate, delta a hat, operated on the ket psi. Now we already know that delta a hat is just the deviation of a hat from its expectation value, by our definition. Now since a hat is Hermitian, delta a hat is also Hermitian, because the expectation value of a Hermitian operator is a real number, so its Hermitian conjugate would just be that same real number. Therefore, we can say that the inner product of f with itself is just the inner product involving the bra psi, delta a hat squared, and the ket psi. But we know from equation 1 that this inner product on the right is just equal to the variance of a times the inner product of psi with itself. And I'm going to label this guy equation 5. So by a similar logic, the inner product of g with itself is the variance of b times the inner product of psi with itself. This I'll call equation 6. Now what about the inner product of f and g, which is our final term in the Schwartz inequality? Well, we know that the bra f is just the bra psi times the Hermitian conjugate of delta a hat, which is just delta a hat itself since delta a hat is Hermitian, so it's equal to its Hermitian conjugate. The ket g we already know from the definition is just delta b hat applied to the ket psi. So as a result, the inner product of f and g is just psi delta a hat delta b hat psi. Now from the definition of the expectation value, this inner product is just the inner product of psi with itself times the expectation value of delta a hat delta b hat. Let's now plug this equation for the inner product of f and g, as well as equations 5 and 6. Let's plug all these equations back into the Schwartz inequality in equation 4. And here's what we will end up with. The inner products of psi and psi on the left cancel with the squared inner product on the right. So after simplifying, the Schwartz inequality reduces to sigma a squared times sigma b squared is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the expectation value of delta a hat, delta b hat, all of that squared. And I'll call this equation 7. Now, we'll use equation 3 to plug in the expectation value for delta a hat times delta b hat, which would just be the sum of the expectation values of each of these two terms, the commutator and the anti-commutator. Here's where we're going to use some properties. The commutator of two Hermitian operators, a hat and b hat, is anti-Hermitian. And as a result, we know from the previous video that its expectation value is imaginary. Additionally, the anti-commutator of two Hermitian operators is also Hermitian, which I also stated in the previous video. And this means the expectation value of this anti-commutator is real. So if we end up taking the magnitude squared of this complex number, we'll have a quarter of the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator a hat comma b hat, all of that squared, plus a quarter of the magnitude of the expectation value of the anti-commutator delta a hat delta b hat, all of that squared. Now the magnitude squared of the imaginary part is obviously going to be less than or equal to the magnitude squared of the whole thing because the magnitude squared of the real part will obviously be greater than or equal to zero. Now we know from the simplified Schwartz inequality in equation 7 that sigma a squared times sigma b squared is greater than or equal to the magnitude of the expectation value of delta a hat delta b hat squared. So by the transitive property of equality, sigma a squared times sigma b squared is then greater than or equal to a quarter of the magnitude squared of the expectation value of the commutator between a hat and b hat. 
Now if we take the square root of both sides, we'll finally end up with sigma a times sigma b is greater than or equal to half the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator between a hat and b hat. And this is called the generalized uncertainty principle. What the generalized uncertainty principle says is that the product of the uncertainties or standard deviations of two observable quantities a and b is greater than or equal to half the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator of the Hermitian operators corresponding to the measurables a and b. So for example, the uncertainty on the position of the particle times the uncertainty on the momentum of a particle is greater than or equal to half the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator of x hat and p hat. Later on, we'll show that this expression on the right hand side becomes h bar over 2, where h bar is the reduced Planck constant. And you might already know this as the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now you might still have some questions about what the uncertainty principle translates to, and you might still be wondering why we care about uncertainties on physical observables when everything's supposed to be exact, at least from a classical mechanics standpoint. Because in classical mechanics, if a particle occupied a certain position, you could easily measure that position, and your measurement wouldn't change with time if the particle is supposed to be fixed there. It doesn't change according to a certain probability distribution or a particular standard deviation. But for quantum mechanics, a lot of classical mechanics rules are thrown out the window in favor of a different framework, where physical observables aren't necessarily exact, they do vary according to a certain probability distribution. But we'll discuss this in more detail later on, so if you're confused right now, then don't worry too much about it. So this should conclude my playlist on the mathematical basis of quantum mechanics. In the next video, I'm going to officially introduce the subject and actually give context to all these equations. Now the tricky part about creating a quantum mechanics lecture series is that there's a lot of uncertainty, haha, -ha, behind how the lecture should be structured. Some books start by talking about the stern gerlach experiments, others start by talking about the history leading up to quantum mechanics, you know, black body radiation, all that fluff. Some books start by introducing vectors, operators, Dirac notation, etc., which is what I did here, and some just jump straight into the Schrodinger equation. There's a lot of ways to learn quantum mechanics, just as there are a lot of ways to teach it. Anyway, that should do it for this lecture. I'd just like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I've put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you wish. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.